All right, if you're new to Hope City, I love to have an anchor verse every single week. It ties the whole message together. And here's my anchor verse for this week, and it'll be on the screens, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. If you have your real Bibles, you can read them. If you're digital, you can watch it up here. Here it is. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs. Somebody say everyone. everyone. But only one person gets the prize. I love this last line. So run to win. Look at the person next to you and say, run to win. One more time. Say it. Run to every campus together. Say, all right, y'all sound good. If you're taking down notes, today's message is titled run to win. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you give us ears to hear. We need it. There's so many things contending for our attention. We need it more than ever. We want to finish well. We want to finish strong. And this entire series is about habits that maybe produce patterns in our lives that take us down rabbit holes and trails, God, that we don't need to go on that are distractions that can ultimately mess with the trajectory of our lives. God, give us ears to hear, a mind ready to understand, and most importantly, a heart ready to receive. If you believe it, say amen. amen. It's amazing. Uh, what you can find going down rabbit trails and some rabbit holes on social media. Have you ever seen chicken with, chickens with arms? That'll take you down a rabbit hole. It looks like this. This is an invention. Somebody actually created this. This person, I guess, has made uh, quite a bit of money off of this invention. And uh, look at this. Yeah, that's like a slap boxing chicken right there. Don't at me. Look at this guy. Can you imagine being at like a social gathering where there are like titans of the industry, like oil and gas and engineering, and they've made their wealth and their fortune, and they're like, hey man, so uh, what, what do you do? I uh, chicken arms. I uh, make chicken arms. It's like a headband, except it's for the body of a chicken. This is real. This is real. And so why are you telling us that? Because the truth is, it's incredible how outlandish creation and innovation and things are in the world. And again, if that, if you invented that, I want to shake your hand or the hand of a chicken, because that's amazing. You made a lot of money. It's incredible though. But in the same way, it's incredible how many distractions exist. Wave at me. If you agree, there's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of things contending for our attention and things that don't matter and things that aren't relevant to our lives in any meaningful way. Yet they'll take us down rabbit holes of distraction for hours every single day. And here's the potential cost, your creativity, your innovation, or so much more, your integrity. So again, going back to social media, my guy, Josh, he's right up here on the front row. He ran up to me the other day. He was super excited about this. And he said, Pastor Daniel, look at this. It's so crazy. And it was a video of greyhounds racing. And I'm not promoting this. There's two things, if you don't know me, that I really don't care much about. Number one's breakfast. I just don't. I I don't know what the hype is. I'll eat breakfast at like dinner time, but like I don't wake up like if I don't get an omelet, I'm done. How many of y'all love breakfast? Like I know I'm gonna get DMs that it's the most important part of the day. I don't understand the hype. The second thing I don't care much about is greyhound racing. I just don't. When people are like talking, I just don't. It's not like it's a common conversation. If it was greyhound buses though, I, I might be interested. It'd be overwhelmingly low energy, but it might be intriguing. So he shows me this. He said, okay, back to the story. He says, Pastor Daniel, I want you to see this video. It was eight dogs, eight dogs racing. They're chasing after this white, fluffy, fake rabbit on this mechanical strap. It was fake for all you people. They're like, oh, that poor rabbit. It was not real. But the story dramatically shifts. Out of nowhere, a real rabbit runs across the track. This is where you're like, oh. And I'm like, buddy, this is not the right time or the right place. He runs di directly across their path. And I'm like, man, this is not the greatest time for your grand entrance or your exit. I don't know what you were doing. Because right in front of you, little rabbit, is eight full-size greyhounds bred over centuries to ultimately hunt you down. So these dogs are chasing and this bunny was at the wrong place at the wrong time. How many of y'all know some people like that? Wrong place, wrong time, all the time. <laughs> Don't look at the person next to you. You're like, who's this guy? <laughs> no, but this rabbit, out of the chaos of what's happening, there were three responses by these eight dogs. The first group veered off, taking their eyes off the prize. They 
They pulled this quick U-turn. They ducked under the fence and took off really quickly after the what we've now established is the dumb rabbit. Okay, I'm sorry. It just They chased after this, this rabbit that just didn't know what he was thinking. The second group got confused, slowed down. They were split in their indecision. Do we continue to follow the mechanical, fluffy, fake rabbit, or do we go after the rest of the rabbit that our friends have chased after? And then there was the last dog. On the sign, he was the S N W O P D O W G. He wasn't, but that was just fun for the story. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was just fun for the story. He was a little slower. I don't know if he got a a, a a slow start. He was a little older. I would even I would even say that he was a little wiser. But here's the key: he didn't waver. He just kept on keeping on, and he kept chasing what he was called to. And that last little S N W O P D O W G got the W. He won the race. Some of you are like, this is a sermon? There's actually a biblical perspective I want to look at, the biblical principle. But let me say this, because I think we can all find ourselves in this trap. Y'all, it's really easy to get distracted. It's really easy. And some of you are like, I'm not distracted by some mechanical rabbit, but you are if she walks by and gives you a certain look. In Proverbs 31, women, if he walks by and you're like, I don't know, he just gets me. <laughs> he and Boaz, okay? It's easy to get distracted. Get rich quick schemes and things that we are constantly drawn to things that are ultimately trying to veer us off course. But here's the key. It's not even about big distractions. Some of you felt convicted in that moment because maybe you're entangled in a relationship that's robbing you of God's best, but you feel stuck. Let's talk about something that's not quite as big, something that's a little bit more small. How many of y'all, by the show of hands across every campus, you, you, you dabble in? You're like, I put my toes a little bit in the social media waters. Like, you get on social media a little bit. Y'all are lying. Only 20% of the room. <laughs> Let me see your algorithm. <laughs> no, the truth is, there was a study, and this is not an Americanized study. This is a global study study, Kenya actually ranked at the very top. It says that the use of social media per day, per person, the low ball, the low ball was 146 minutes a day, 146 minutes a day. Let, let me add this up in a calendar of 365 days a year. That is 36 consecutive days on social media every year. This study showed that the average person spends 800 and 88 hours a year on social media. Some of you are like, I'm not even on social media, but you still check your MySpace. Amen, I don't know. <laughs> and then I hear this all the time. Well, Pastor Dan, I'd love to serve. I'd, lo I'd love to be disciplined. I'd love to come to the Bible study. I'd love to read my Bible and pray more, but I just don't have time. What if by walking in here this weekend or tuning online, I just gave you pearls here. I'm about to give you 36 days back, or at least 30. Let me give you 30 days back right here. Here's a gift. Well, how do I do that? Get your Instagram in check. Get your TikTok usage in check. Because again, your algorithm is telling me that you're not engaging in something that's necessarily beneficial to you. But pastor, I'm just so tired. This is how I decompress with one month of your life glued to a screen, taking in other people's content, falling in the comparison trap of someone else's controlled online life. I watched this reel the other day. There's this couple and they like, they like, they're funny and they do like some dancing stuff and they, you know, they build houses and do some fun stuff. And he said, do you want to see a behind the scenes of the way this really is? He sets up the camera, the camera falls over. She's like, boy, what's the matter with you? You can't clap and dance on beats. Like they were arguing, but the one they posted was perfect. We end up consumed by things that aren't necessarily adding any value or worth. Now, if you leave here today, because if you're here only, you only pick up 5% of what I say. You're like, I don't know, the guy with the beard told me to get off social media. I don't know. He had a fancy beard, and he said that. Back to our anchor verse, adding a few more verses to it. I'm going to help you. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24 through 27. We opened with 24. Do you not get that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get the crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run. I love Paul's words, like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a box, like a boxer beating the air. 27, this gets a little wild. He says, no, I strike a blow to my body. I make it a slave 
so that after I preach to others, I will myself not be disqualified for the prize. Paul didn't claim and never has, as you read through his life, he never claimed to be immune or without distractions. But Paul also told us that he struck a blow to his body. What's that mean? He, it means this. He denied his flesh. He was denying his flesh so that what he believed and what he lived out would be in alignment. It would run parallel. And it would ultimately be connected to the heart of God. If you're in the room today, I believe this wholeheartedly. God wants to loose you from distractions. And get you to a place where you can hear, pursue, and execute God's good plan for your life. Come on, somebody say out loud, he has good plans for me. Amen. Elbow the person next to you and say, even you, even you, he does. I'm going to give you some practical takeaways. So how do we avoid the rabbit hole? Number one, write this down. You need to build your blinders. You need to build your blinders. Build your blinders. What, what, what does that mean? In horse racing, we're shifting from greyhound racing to horse racing now. <laughs> In horse racing, many racehorse trainers believe that blinders or blinkers, as they are sometimes called, keep horses focused. It looks like this. This is what it looks like. Some of you are like, can my husband wear that? And so he did. <laughs> Interestingly, I'm glad you asked. In an age of distractions, Panasonic, throw this pick up, Panasonic <laughs> started making these for humans. So when you're sitting at your cubicle, you're not distracted. You're not going to sneak up on me. I'm not getting shanked for nobody. I'm not wearing that thing. Look at that. No, but they say that we're so distracted. We're so consumed by all the things contending for our attention. And even though this is a little extreme, I do believe that we in our everyday lives have to build boundaries. We have to build blinders. So what does that look like? Put accountability in place. So that despite life's distractions, you'll find yourselves running your race with your eyes fixed on Jesus and following the plans God's way, not the world's. Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 through 30. Now let me give you some context when Matthew is talking about this. This is wild, but he's talking about denying like Paul did. He's not talking about this moment literally. He's talking about it passionately to deny our flesh. Look at this, Matthew 5, 29 and 30. If your right eye causes you to stumble, this is wild, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Like, good Lord, Matthew. <laughs> and if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body again than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Again, he wasn't saying this from a literal place. We do believe, though, that Matthew is passionately, again, trying to persuade us towards realizing, y'all, your, your flesh is powerful. The Bible says your spirit is willing, but your flesh is, is weak. And so he's talking about us. Listen, there's an importance, this is what Matthew's trying to explain to us, of prioritizing righteousness. But the harsh reality is that all of us will face in our humanity is that our flesh is constantly trying to convince us that we can make ourselves bigger, and even smarter than God. And it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be surprising to us because if you go all the way back into Genesis, the same tricks and schemes of the enemy, the devil, the serpent at that moment was trying to convince Adam and Eve to eat of the tree. We know this because why? Because listen, God doesn't want you to know that you can be like him, that you can know everything like him it's been a trick of the enemy for a long, long time, but Jeremiah 17, 9, ooh, he paints this picture. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. You can see that in a Lifetime movie. It gets wild on that. <laughs> You're like, only watch Hallmark. Okay, well, this is what the Bible says. <laughs> Again, to attain the, crowd and, uh, the crown and not find ourselves falling down the rabbit holes laid out by the enemy our adversary, the one who is trying to set hidden traps and dangers. Y'all, we have to build out our blinders. And here's some practical ways to do that. Number one, get accountable. I said, find accountability. You have to get accountable. This means lock into a community, a friend, a group of friends who are committed to pursuing righteousness, not gassing you up to live the way you used to, but people that are passionate about seeing themselves in you walk with God. And while this requires vulnerability, y'all, it is worth it. 
Some of you are like, well, I've got that. And some of you would say, I don't. But let's be honest, community is often difficult. Probably the number one thing that Pastor Jackie and I get uh, uh, talked about in the lobby, and they say, I- I'm here because I want to grow. I love y'all. I love the worship. I love your preaching. I love all that. I'm just, I, I'm looking for friends. I'm looking for community, and it's difficult, especially in the 21st century. But that's why we're very, very intentional. We've created groups for you to plug in. We've created these Bible study moments for you to plug into. We have a midweek chapel that happens at 11 a.m. every Wednesday. For those who can't always make the weekends, they can show up and be a part of our 11 o'clock midweek experience. We're intentional about this because we know that our church is large enough to serve a city, to make a dent in the city to make a dent in the need of our city. But our groups, our Bible studies, our midweek chapel is small enough so that you can know each other. So number one, we have to get accountable. Number two, this is easy. We gotta get practical. If you're struggling with lust, there's a software that you can put on your devices, your iPad, your computers, your iPhones, your droids. Two different ones that I would recommend. One is Covenant Eyes. You can put that on there. There's another one called Triple X Church. Make sure you put church. (laughs) Triple church.com. These are softwares you can download for accountability purposes. If you struggle with this, you got to get practical. If you're like, man, the only thing I like to do, I got a fever and the only prescription is more dancing and you like to go to the club, fill your time and your schedule with something else. Jump into a group. Y'all get in the gym, do something else. Reroute and become more practical. Elbow your second choice and say, that was for you. I don't know if that was for anybody else, but I felt really strong about that. And then the last one here about building our blinders is get spiritual. Ask God to protect you from the attacks of the enemy. There is power in prayer, and God gave us the perfect model through Jesus' life on how to start out every single day strong, asking for guidance, asking for protection. This is what it says in Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. Jesus, he models this prayer for us. This is how we should pray. This is what Jesus says. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Another translation says, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have trespassed or sinned against us. And then he goes on and says this, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Another translation says, deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is a roadmap. I don't know how to pray. Pastor Daniel, pray this prayer. This is the model that Jesus set up. Give us this day our daily bread. As I let go of offense, as I let go of unforgiveness, as I let go of bitterness and anything that I have been holding on to or that's been holding me captive, I release it. Get spiritual. Y'all, sometimes the best offense is a good defense. The GOAT, and I'll I'll stand up here and I'll say this until I take my last breath. The GOAT, Michael Jordan, come on somebody. All you LeBron fans, just stay real quiet. He's good, amen. <laughs> but, no, but Michael Jordan was amazing offensively, but what he was actually really, really known for in the world of competitive basketball was his defensive skills. The, great, the best offense is good defense. And God is our great defender. And I want to encourage someone today. I want to challenge, but I also want to invite you to invite him into your struggle. Don't compartmentalize the stuff that's been trying to rob you of your joy. Don't compartmentalize the things that is trying to hold you back. Invite him today into your struggle. Get accountable, get practical, get spiritual, and build your blinders. You know, the fall of Adam was not that he saw too little. The truth is he saw too much. We have to stop looking for things God is looking to shield from you. Some of you are opening up doors that God's like, hey, this is a free will issue. You're opening up doors that God was trying to close for your protection. Some of y'all, God tries to shut the door and you put your foot in the way. Like, but he's so handsome. Now put, get your foot back. Girl, get your foot back. Amen. We have to recognize that God is ultimately trying to guard our hearts because he has a great and good plan for our lives. So we've been talking about building your blinders. Number two, write this one down. We have to find, find your rhythm. Find your rhythm. This has nothing to do with music. Praise God. 
for some of you. Amen. Find your rhythm. Find a pace, a cadence. There's a grace for the race that God has set before you. And Paul compared life, a lot of racing today, a lot of racing. We got the, we got the greyhounds and the horses, and now we're on this. Paul compared life to a race. And if you've ever finished a race, you know that you have to pace yourself to finish the race. It's not a sprint. It's a long distance thing. We have a friend named Kevin who's ran in marathons literally all over the world. Like he ranked in the Boston Marathon, like super, super high ranking. And they were super impressed because he did it barefoot. He trained for months barefoot. And it gives him more agility and speed. And I'm like, then you can't walk for six days afterwards. He's like, it's worth it. I'm like, is it? <laughs> but he talked about this. He's, I said, what happens when you hit the wall? How many, how many of y'all are runners in the room? Like you run. Okay, I only run if I'm being chased. Amen. <laughs> You want to see me run chase after me. Amen. No, no, I'm not a big runner, but he talks about the importance when he hits that mental wall. He says, I have to syncopate and find my cadence. I syncopate my breathing with my steps. Step, 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 step. And he said, I syncopate my timing. And in that syncopation, I feel like I find my cadence. And then I feel like I lock in and then a mile goes by and two miles go by and step, step. And he said, I'm breathing and I'm stepping. I find my cadence. Y'all, there is a grace for the pace. There is a grace and a cadence that God wants us to lock in step with him on. Another form of racing. Let's just keep doing this. I like this. Formula One, how many of y'all are into like car racing? You're into like, okay, cool, Formula One, nine of you. Okay, great. Maybe the other services. Formula One is one of the fastest growing sports in the world, even though this poll failed me. When it comes to car racing, it's not just the speed, though, that matters. There's lots of things to take in consideration. There's fuel consumption, meaning how far can you go with the energy that's on hand. There's wear and tear. How long will the tires last, the stress on the engine, the amount of maintenance needed to have a vehicle that can make it through not just this race, but maybe future races? There's also a crew. Come on, that feels like our dream team. Make some noise for the dream team. Come on. There's also a crew on hand to keep the vehicle in check. So, And then there's the track. And oftentimes the drivers will get there early and walk the track so that they can be in step ahead of the main event. I think as Christians, we often approach seasons of difficulty with the attitude of how quickly can I get through this and move on to the next thing? How many of y'all have ever fall, fallen in that trap? I just want to get past this so I can move into the next. And I don't think that's God's intention for us. As a parent, I have to be mindful of this, that the days are long, but the years are short. I walked into Fox's room the other day and I thought we had been robbed. He's five. I thought that somebody broke in and only ransacked his room. I said, everything else seems okay, but they only wanted what was in his toy zone. And I believe this. I believe this wholeheartedly. I believe one day when he's grown up and moved on and it's just Jackie and me, she's still going to look exactly the same. She doesn't age. I don't know what it is. I'm aging over here like an American president. She looks amazing. Somebody the other day looked in our office and they looked at our wedding picture and they were like, what is happening? Life has not been kind to you, sir. I'm like, you don't have to say everything you're thinking. Okay. But I, I believe this. I believe one day I'm going to miss tripping on his Legos and almost blowing out my ACL. I do. Because the days are long, but the years are short. And I don't believe that God is wanting us to just get through every day. Your whole life is a gift. Every day matters. And the people that we're called to reach every day and the storms we're supposed to get in front of. Now, there are just some days where like, oh, that's a wash. Six o'clock at night, I'm going to bed. I get it. But life's a gift. And every single day, life is but a vapor. Make today count. Look at the person next to you awkwardly in the eyes, really strongly, and be like, Every day matters, buddy. Say that. I'm forcing y'all into that. That's so fun for me. All right, let me flip your thinking for a moment. Let me flip your thinking for a moment. What if God is less concerned about the speed of which you accomplish or go through life, but instead he's more focused about the pace and the rhythm that you walk it out with him? What if every single day you would say, God, I want to be lockstep and find my step, 
step and lock in my cadence with your heart. The Bible says in Psalms 139, 16, you saw me before I was born. Every day in my life. Not every day in my life and a few wasted ones. Every day in my life was recorded in your book. Every single moment was laid out before a single day had passed. God knows the end from the beginning and he knows what you're gonna walk through in the middle. The race is in his hands, but the pace is in yours. So how are you running it? How are you living at your every day? Let me give you a challenge. If you call me your pastor, maybe you're new to the church, you're like, I'm kind of liking it though. I see what's happening. You look like a golfer. Like, I'm not, but maybe someday. If I'm your pastor, I'm gonna give you a challenge. Don't be an all at once and then not at all Christian. Don't be a, I'm gonna serve a little while and then I'm just never gonna serve again. Don't be a, I think I'll read the Bible for a few days and then a few months will go by and I'm like, ooh, I should probably find my Bible. No, no, this should be something that we look at as a daily discipline. You want real growth to happen in your life even when you don't, even when it doesn't feel good or you don't feel like it, get daily discipline. There's a friend of ours who normally sits on the front row. His name's Mo and he works out all the time and there's a daily discipline in Mo's life. I, I thought that his muscles were built into the little jackets he wears, but it's not. It's because he is disciplined. And I told him one day, he's like, bro, I can make you like that. I was like, I was born without muscle mass. So um, I wasn't, that's just my excuse. But there's a daily discipline with Mo. And there's a bunch of folks that come from Alpha Land. They work out all the time. Rodney, who leads worship, there's about 40 deep that come. He invites everybody. But there's a daily discipline. And a lot of times when you talk to them, it's a, that's their decompression. That's their stress relieving. And here's the thing about daily discipline spiritually. You cannot microwave spiritual maturity. You want to grow in the things of God? Get in the word every day. You want to grow in your prayer life? Pray every day. Even if it feels like you're just murmuring and not saying much, just sit in his presence and just listen. Because I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is always speaking. When you're focused and disciplined, kicks in, then you start valuing long-term goals more than short-term sacrifice. And what ends up happening is you realize the reason you're on this planet so that you can run your race well, avoiding the rabbit holes and the hidden traps that the enemy has laid out to deceive you. And here's the last one. Write this down. You have to find your, you have to find your reason. We talk about our why a lot here. You have to find your reason. Why do you get up in the mornings? Why do you wake up and go through the day? Some of you are like, oh, just, I'm just surviving. I get it. But the breath you're breathing is a gift. Pastor Jackie said something a few months ago, and I loved it. She said, look at your feet. Right now, look at your feet. You can do it right now. Look at your feet. Let's do it again. Everybody did it, so let's look at our feet. <laughs> she said, you're standing in his faithfulness. You realize you're standing in his faithfulness? That you never should have made it? That if we had to pay the debt that we owe, ooh, some of y'all got a lot of debt. I'm not talking about credit cards. I'm talking about stuff you've done, decisions you've made. We're standing in his faithfulness and his love has never stopped chasing you. His grace has never stopped, has never given up on you. His mercy is present right there every morning. So you have to find your reason. I love this quote. The two most important days in your life are the day you were born the day you find out why. The day you were born, the day you find out why, and I'm proof of this, y'all, I was born an accident. Like the doctor tried to convince my mom to abort me. Some of y'all know my story. The day you were born, the day you find out why. As a pastor, Pastor Jackie and I, as pastors, we coach people on finding their why a lot. And too often, what ends up happening is we don't recognize why we're here and we don't take the, the time to evaluate why we're living and even breathing on this earth. But I'm certain that if people would just pause and ask themselves, and then ask the Lord, actually, why am I on this planet? There would be more churches hungry for the things of God. There would be more people being romanced to Jesus. You know, I said this quote on Easter. If you made Easter, you might have heard me say it. Maybe you were distracted because you had to fight the crowds and almost fought somebody in the parking lot. I'm okay. I get it. I get what you dealt with. I, thank you for coming. 
But, but I, I, I think about how there are people's lives, again, connected to, to our destinies and our, and our purpose. And we're not trying to build churches to just have big numbers. We're, we're building churches and we're building this new building for West Houston. And we're looking for a location for Katie. And we're consistently using big faith to take territory because we want to romance as many people to Jesus on Easter the line I said that was sobering was that 2.4 billion people are like, whoa, 2.4 billion people identify as a Christian. That's amazing. But that means over 5 billion don't. Y'all, there's work to be done. There are people to romance to Jesus. And we're not a church of universalism. We do not believe that all gods lead back to one God. We believe that Jesus, and I'm gonna say this as often as I can, is the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way to the Father is through him. And if you don't fully understand the scope of that, we'll introduce you to him. At the very end of my message, I'll give you an opportunity to know him, rededicate your life. I believe our churches would be more on fire. I believe when people would, would really discover their why, they'll recognize that they're either born on purpose or they're not. And the truth is, according to the Bible, you were born absolutely on purpose. And the Bible says it this way, Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20. Therefore, this is the purpose that we're all called to. Whether you have a mic, you have the ability to sing like Rodney or Kim or Larissa, or you work in the marketplace. You have another career, another assignment. Therefore, this is our call though. This is our, this is our why. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name. Every time I say that, I think I'm not your Libre. Baptizing. If you're not seeing that, it's not funny to you. I'm concerned about your salvation and stuff. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I'm going to present a big idea for just a moment. Will you close your eyes for a moment? Maybe you've thought about this. Maybe you don't allow yourself to go here. But when you die, because we all will, we all will have to face the reality that we're here today and gone some other day. The truth is, there's only one thing that you can bring with you. Think about that for a moment. What do you think that is? When you die, there's only one thing that you can bring with you. It's not your house. It's not that boat. It's not that car that you saved up for. It's not your clothes. It's not your sneaker collection, which I'm arm wrestling the Lord on that. It's not that high school trophy, your glory days. It's not those college, that college degree, your multiple degrees, or your ACT. You know, the only thing that you can bring with you when you die, look at me, is people. It's people. That's why we're here. God has saved us, ransomed us from death, and made possible a life in Christ so that we can find fulfillment in him in the midst of the dark and chaotic, dying world that we're a part of, where we're seeing wars and rumors of wars, where we're seeing the chaos that happens, but it doesn't cause us to retreat. It causes our light to get brighter. It causes us to get stronger, to share the hope with others in the midst of the chaos. There's an old song, a lot of you may know it. I grew up singing this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Come on, you sing it. This yeah, yeah. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I love hearing my baby sing it, but here's my question in your adult living Is that true now? Are you letting it shine? When you walk into a room, does the atmosphere change? Does your kids see you as chosen by God? And again, none of us are going to live perfect. I've been saying for the last few weeks, Christianity is not about behavior modification. It's about heart transformation. But when the light comes alive, are you letting it shine? Are you getting in the way of people's storms and saying, let me tell you about my Jesus? Let me tell you how I went from nothing to something, how I went from rejected to accepted, how I went from broken to breakthrough, from, de from, from desperate to deliverance. Are you letting it shine? Because if you are, let me ask this question. If you're letting it shine, are you inviting others to church? If you're letting it shine, does your neighbors and coworkers know it? If you're letting it shine, when's the last time you've 
minister to that hopeless family member that people have written off? Are you living out the fullness of God? Are you walking as a testimony of his goodness? Are you a safe harbor introducing people to the real safe harbor? Are you keeping it quiet? Are you keeping it quiet because y'all, if he's the reason for your living, if he's the purpose behind the plans you're carrying out in your everyday lives, then you'll start seeing, wow, I'm running to win. I'm not running to survive life. I'm not spending my downtime in rabbit holes. No, no, that'll become less and less. You'll begin to put boundaries and safeguards and practical things in your life. So when the attacks of the enemy comes, you know, you'll say, no, 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 devil, not today. I'm lockstep with the Lord. He's guiding me and directing me. I found my cadence with his heart, my purpose in him, because I know he has a good plan. Because I want to say this to somebody, because I need you to hear this sobering reality of running to win your kids or your future kids. Some of you are like, ah, he got me there. Your kids or your future kids are counting on you responding. Your marriage or your future marriage is counting on you responding. Your future and the assignment and the call of God on your life is counting on you responding. So will you stay distracted as the world continues to create more and more distractions? Or will you say, no, 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 God, I want to lock in with your heart. Come on, somebody say out loud if you receive something from this message. I'm going to run to win. One more time, say it. I'm going to run. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you today for ears that have heard this word. And God, I pray that it doesn't fall on hardened hearts, but if it did, God, I pray that you'd soften them now. That last line, I can't, I can't shake it. It makes me emotional that your kids or your future kids are counting on you responding. Your marriage or your future marriage is counting on you responding. The calling and the purpose that you have for each and every one of us, which is beautiful. It's not without struggle. Woo. It's not without issues. It's not without valleys and mountaintop moments, but those connected to our purpose are counting on us to respond to our reason for living. God, I pray right now for every life, every daughter, every son, every brother, every sister, every person in the room across our campuses, Katie Woodlands watching online, stumbled upon this on Facebook or YouTube. Maybe somebody sent you the link. If you're watching today or you're listening today and you say, Pastor Daniel, here's the truth. I'm not lockstep. I haven't found my pace. I haven't found my rhythm. I'm not putting up blinders and I'm honestly, I'm not living out my reason because I don't know Jesus as my savior, but I want to. Today, I want to rededicate my life. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're the second invitation. You say, oh, or I've given my life to the Lord, but I want to rededicate my life. I've fallen out of sync. I haven't been lockstep with him. I've been allowing things to distract me and that whole social media reality of time consuming rabbit holes. Yeah, that's me. The truth is I want to lock my cadence in my heart back into alignment with Jesus today. I'm going to give my life to Jesus for the very first time. Maybe the second invitation. I want to rededicate my life. If that's you, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over the room. We're looking all over every campus. I see you and you and you and I see you and you and you and you and I see you and you and you and I see you back there. Amazing. Come on, will you stand to your feet? And we're all going to pray this prayer and then I'm going to get you out of here quick. Would you lift your hands towards heaven? Say this out loud, everybody. Lift your hands towards heaven. Say this out loud. Say, Jesus, here I am. All of me. Surrendering everything. All my sins. All my issues. All my struggles. I let it all go. And I ask for your forgiveness. From this moment on, I'm choosing to live for you. Because Jesus, I'm grateful that you exchanged your life for mine so that I could live a life filled with hope and filled with freedom. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. 
in Jesus' name. This is a good place to give God praise. Come on.